members' statements, and I recognize the member for Markham Unionville. Speaker, if you seek it, you will find unanimous consent to allow members to wear purple ribbon in recognition of May 10 being Lupus Awareness Day. I apologize. It. Um, the member for Markham Unionville is seeking unanimous consent to allow MPPs to wear ribbons uh, in recognition of May 10th being Lupus Awareness Day. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Member statements? I recognize the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. During private members' public business this evening, I will be moving my motion regarding artificial intelligence use in government. That's a good idea. Speaker, we are a government that is building a better Ontario, which includes building a better, more productive, positive customer service transformation for Ontarians. Today, there is no legislation governing the safe and responsible use of AI in any provincial or territorial jurisdiction in Canada, nor within the federal government itself. As a government, we need to ensure a secure digital future. To do this, we need to fine-tune our own data to, and also to build our foundational model. With this, we can harness the power of AI within government while building the necessary guardrails to protect our data. I would like to recognize and thank the Minister of Public Service and uh, Public Business and Service Delivery for all the work performed to date, from consultations to the formation of the AI Working Group to the publication of Ontario's trustworthy AI framework. The purpose of this motion is to move the government forward with the next critical steps, to adopt methods to assess potential risks, to judge the successful adoption and ethical use of AI. AI, all the while developing measures to counter emerging cybersecurity threats. I look forward to this evening's public business debate. Here, here. For the member statements, I recognize the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. I rise to celebrate the Niagara Folk Arts Festival, Canada's longest continuous heritage festival, now marking its 56th year. My community is so proud of the Niagara Folk Arts Festival. Each year, I look forward to the open houses, to the culture attire, to the conversations, and it reminds me last year when I met a family who shared their journey as refugees, reminding me of my own history we share. There is nothing more Canadian than that. Speaker, my grandmother was a quilter, and each year she would begin a new quilt. It didn't matter the size or the color of the cloth, because when woven together, we, brought together, we were brought together. It made one complete, harmonious whole. I treasure these quilts. They remind me of the Folk Arts Festival. It's a vivid reminder of the uniqueness, the inclusivity of every culture in Niagara. No matter the debate or the division in this chamber, we should be aspiring to reflect the inclusive spirits that thrive in our own communities. It is our duty to stand for inclusion, for diversity, for making sure there are spaces for both. I encourage all members to come to Niagara and celebrate the many vibrant communities with us. We welcome you to come and join and visit one of the many open houses that will be for the next 15 days. Come travel the world with the Niagara Folk Arts Festival. Right Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is the 30th anniversary of the creation of the International Thalassema Day on May 8, 1994. Three years ago, I was proud to co-sponsor a private member's bill with my friend from Barrie Innisville to proclaim May 8 as Thalassema Awareness Day each year here in Ontario. On behalf of people like Mary Alfano, a mother of twins living with thalassemia in my community in Mississauga Lakeshore. This is a day to help raise awareness of one of the most common blood disorders in the world. The genes for which are carried by up to 2% of the world's population, much like sickle cell anemia, patients with thalassemia can't produce normal red blood cells, so they need to regularly do blood transfusion to supply enough oxygen to the heart, brain, and lungs, and other organs. 
This is sometimes called Mediterranean anemia because it most often affects people from the Middle East, North Africa, Greece, and Italy, especially the regions of Sardinia, Sicily, and Calabria. And just like patients with sickle cell disease, thalassemia patients have had to deal with stigma and discrimination. And I want to thank the Thalassemia Foundation of Canada for everything they do to advocate for thalassemia patients and to support scientific research into new treatments. And as I ask all members here to join us to raise awareness for thalassemia and to support the Foundation's work to ensure that all patients can live a long and healthy life. Thank you. And thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I rise to commemorate a friend of mine, community leader and wise spirit, Pauline Rose Shirt, Nimekwe, who died this week. Pauline was beloved in our Toronto Danforth community. Cannot do full justice to her story or her impact in this statement, but I want to note a few things. Pauline was a Plains Cree elder from Saddle Lake, Alberta, Red Tail Hawk Clan, and member of the Three Fires Society and Buffalo Dance Society. In 1974, Pauline and her then-husband, Vern Harper, led the Native People's Caravan. The caravan travelled from Vancouver to Ottawa to deliver a manifesto to the government on the treatment of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Pauline was the elder at George Brown College in Toronto, and in 2023, she was appointed to the Order of Ontario. Pauline served on the Elders' Council of the Urban Indigenous Education Centre starting in 2008. In our community, she was best known for being the founder of Kapapa Machekpu Wandering Spirit School. My apologies for terrible pronunciation. In 1976, after unsuccessfully trying to find a public school that was culturally appropriate for her son's education, Pauline started the Wandering Spirit Survival School. In 1983, it was officially recognized as a cultural survival native way school. In 2019, there was a renaming ceremony to return it to its origins, Wandering Spirit School. She was a warm presence at powwows and First Nations celebrations throughout our community. I want to convey my condolences to her remaining family and thank her now for all she did to build our community. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Nepean. Today is about Honorary Colonel Dan Mackay. Dan, of course, is a decorated reservist having served 44 years in uniform and having commanded the Cameron Highlanders of Ottawa twice. He served as the Deputy Director of History and Heritage at the National Defence Department, and he served as the aide de camp to our Lieutenant Governor for over 30 years. He is a Knight of the Justice of the Most Venerable Order of the Hospital of St. John Ambulance, and he is one of the most humble men that I have ever met. He is dedicated and he's committed to all things Ottawa. But he's also, and this will surprise him when I say it, an unlikely feminist. Dan has been a girl dad. He has been the biggest defender and champion of his wife, Fran, who is now in her own right the um, Lieutenant Colonel of, Honorary Lieutenant Colonel of the Governor General's Foot Guards. He is a big champion of the Lieutenant Honorary Colonel of the Cameron Highlanders, Barbara Farber. And he is a steadfast reminder to all of us of how important our history is by recognizing Lillian Freeman, the poppy lady who first brought the poppy to Canada, who founded the Royal Canadian Legion, and whose home is now the Army Officers' Mess in the city of Ottawa. Dan has been a champion and a reminder that women are important in Canada. And as much as he has accolades in the military and throughout the city of Ottawa, he has always quietly stood behind every woman he has supported. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. A recent Hamilton Spectator article broke down the homelessness death data published by research group Hamilton Homeless Morality, data that tells a daunting story driven by lived experiences of those living rough on our streets. 91 deaths in two and a half years is horrific. Half of those deaths were caused by drug overdoses and half suffered from mental illness. And if those numbers are not disturbing enough, 
the story continues. 90% of homeless people who died were men, and nearly 50% of these deaths had lived on the streets for more than a year. Homelessness is killing Hamiltonians. In fact, the average death, age of death amongst homeless Hamiltonians is 46, what some would call midlife. The numbers do not lie. This story can have a different ending, an outcome that meets at the intersection of love, hope and support, a story that our communities want to tell and share. Housing impacts people's lives. It can lengthen their lives and it can save their lives. Many community members, partners and organizations are doing just that. They're tirelessly doing the heavy lifting to provide shelter, stability and health care. Together, we must meet people where they are at. Everyone deserves a place to call home. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Eglinton Lawrence. Ontario and throughout the world observed Yom HaShoah, the day of commemoration for the six million Jews who were murdered by Nazi Germany and its collaborators during the Holocaust. Known in English as Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah also commemorates the, the members of the Jewish resistance who fought against the Nazis during the Holocaust. Yom HaShoah reminds us that the Holocaust is both a lesson from the past and a warning for the future. It shows us the perils of indifference and the horrific consequences when hatred is allowed to flourish unchecked. On October 7th, when, to quote Rex Murphy, a cowardly medieval murder cult, campus heroes, Hamas, took the lives of over 1,200 Jews and others in Israel, since then we're facing anti-Semitic increase, uh, uh, increase in events uh, beyond acceptable levels here, even in Canada, because really the only acceptable level is zero. Anti-Semitic incidents take many forms, hate speech, vandalism, in intimidation, but they're all manifestations of a broader attack on the fundamental idea that all Ontarians should be treated equally, with respect, and feel safe to live their lives freely in Ontario. The mass murder of the Holocaust lasted from 1941 to 45, but it's important to remember that it started long before them, almost a decade before, in 1932. The best way to stop anti-Semitism is to ensure it never starts. As human beings, we all share a duty to all other human beings to treat them with dignity and respect because they are human beings. We cannot forget the terrible tragedy of the Holocaust and the lessons learned. We must always stand up against anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. Never again is now. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, I heard from many people in my riding of Don Valley North, including parents and teachers. They proud the government for its tough and necessary actions of restricting cell phone usage and banning vaping along with all tobacco, nicotine, and cannabis products in schools. Now, they feel much more confidence in our education system. Speaker, excessive cell phone usage and vaping are two issues that have long plagued students' physical and mental health and productivity levels. A third of the world's population is at risk of, of smartphone addiction, which has negative impacts on a student's short-term and long-term information retention and overall academic performance. As well, in Canada, one in four older high school students reported vaping in the past month, even though it is clearly illegal for those under age 18. Speaker, from zero tolerance and mandatory learning and prevention campaigns to security cameras and vaping detectors, this government is taking concrete action to protect our province's students so that they may have the greatest chance to succeed for the, for the sake of their future and ours. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Mississauga-Malton. Speaker, 
Vision is viral, offering direction, purpose, and motivation, driving action towards fulfillment and growth. On contrast, the recent data shows a staggering 2.1 million Canadians are grappling with blindness or partial sight, with over 5.6 million contests with vision-threatening conditions. In Ontario, only 65% of children receive an eye examination before their seventh birthday, and only 2% adhere to the recommendation for age-appropriate eye assessment, including many residents from Mississauga Malton. This could lead to undetected vision problem, hindering children's academic performance, social interactions, and overall quality of life. Thanks to former Senator Dr. Asha Seth, due to her effort, May is a National Vision Health Month and aims to increase the awareness of importance of eye health and methods to prevent vision impairment. My sincere gratitude to CINIB for their continued work on supporting the education and awareness on vision-related needs in Canada. They are here today, so I urge all MPPs to join them in room 228 between 12 to 2 p.m. to delve deeper and explore actionable solution to support our Ontarians. Speaker, together, let's strive towards a prosperous Ontario. This is a non-partisan issue. We have the same goal to serve our people of Ontario, where every, everyone receives the necessary support and service to flourish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. Colleagues, as many of you are aware, my riding of Brantford Brant is home to a vibrant, motivated, and active cadet movement. Today, we welcome the top cadets as chosen by their commanding officers for their dedication, for their excellence, and for their willingness to make our community the best that it can be. The cadets of Brantford Brant not only improve themselves, but also improve the communities that we serve together. I know that the son of my executive assistant joined the cadet program as a shy boy and emerged as a confident and refined young man. Sorry to embarrass you, Dan Daniel. <laughs> For the Navy League Cadet Corps, Admiral Landy Moore, we have ordinary cadet Matthew Kelly and able cadet Nayla Anderson, joined by Lieutenant Richard Carpenter, Midshipman John Sindon, and Lieutenant Catherine Lapointe. For the Royal Canadian Sea Cadets, Admiral Nellis, we have Joshua Ocampo and Chief Petty Officer Second Class Julia Coxus Rostanovich, joined by Lieutenant Rendell Robb. For the 2569 Royal Canadian Army Cadets, we have Chief Warrant Officer Kiriana Jorgensen and Master Warrant Officer Christian Kwan, joined by Captain Jenny. For the Royal Canadian Air Cadets 104th Starfighter Squadron, we have Flight Corporal Arthava Saraswat and Sergeant Shane Chapin, joined by Officer Cadet Craig Shaw. Cadets, Officers, the people of Ontario salute you for your hard work and contribution to Brantford Brant. Thank you very much. 